All right. Well, good morning. <laughs> uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of being able to gather together to worship you and to dig into your word and learn more about your teachings for our life, both this life we now live in a fallen world and also the glorious life to come that we have been granted through the grace of Jesus. Uh, bless our class today. Uh, bless, good, bless our discussion that it may be uplifting and enlightening uh, for all those who are here. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, we hadn't quite finished up with last week's stuff. We're on page 16, if you brought your outline from last week. Um, and uh, I hope you had a chance to read some of the appendices there. Uh, it gave you some insight into like some of the church calendar stuff that relates to how we kind of work the creed and its basic teachings into the church year every year and that kind of thing. Um, but we're going to focus on what did Jesus do, right? I've always liked that question better than what would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? So we're thinking of the Apostles' Creed. Let's just list off some of the things. What did Jesus do? Died for our mm -hmm. sins. Yeah, died on the cross. All right, they died on the cross. Okay, what else do you rose from the dead? Rose from the dead. Right, that's an important part. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. Yeah, rose from the dead. What else? Saved us from our sins. Saved us from our sins. Remember, we talked about last week, are the creed is, is it vague or is it really specific? It's very specific, right? So there's a few other things that are mentioned there. It mentioned that he suffers, which is an odd thing for God to do. He, he suffers. He goes to hell. Goes to hell. He dies the death of three days. So are there any names in there? He ascends. He ascends, yeah. That's good one. He became a man. He became a man. How do you become a man? I don't know. <laughs> because he I knew you were going to ask me. Right? <laughs> because, yeah, he was conceived and born, right? Oh, yeah. yeah that's all right. And <laughs> that happened. That he, was, uh, he had, didn't have any sense. He was. Oh, yeah. He was perfect. He was perfect. Yeah. I think we got all the big ones. Those are good, right? And as we look through those things and we think about God's plan of salvation, they all kind of need to be there, right? Right? He needs to suffer because he is enduring the, the sins that are not his own, but the world's and ours, right? And he has no sin. Um, right. And he's doing that while remaining perfect because the reason he came and became man is that in order for mankind to be redeemed, a man had to keep the law. But can regular men Mankind, men and women, can we keep the law? No, right? Not we can't well. do that. And so that's why he went to him because he was perfect. Very good, right? He had to do what we could not, right? That is the mercy of God. Um, so he became a man, endured suffering and sins, but yet remained perfect. Then he dies on the cross, <laughs> rises from the dead. Well, so he dies on the cross, he goes to hell, right? That's the just penalty for sinfulness. And you know, they never taught that in the Catholic religion. They never said he went to hell. Yeah. I, I had a conversation actually in a new member class. I taught at my previous church with somebody who we did the creed. And I said, if there's anything you have questions about, he said, why are we saying that Jesus went to hell? He didn't go to hell. Well, let's talk about that. Um, he did go to hell because that's, we, that's our expression of the reality that God didn't just, like Jesus didn't just pretend to die. He really died, right? And he died the death of you and me. He died the death we deserve. And so what, what are the wages of sin? They're death, right? And not just like little, little D death, but capital D death, right? The bad one that lasts forever. Well, he was right? crucified next to two criminals, too. Well, just that death in and of itself is the most humiliating form of dying because it was for the worst criminals, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he remains perfect. So he's died on the cross, goes to hell. 
Yet hell cannot contain him, obviously, right? Because he's God. And so he rises from the dead and then he ascends. And all of that put together is he saves us from us, like well, ourselves. I remember right? you also Our said that Satan was an angel and then he went. Yep. We, he went south. He was. Yep. He went bad. He went really yep. Bad. So all that is him saving us from our sin. So that is what Jesus does, right? So in our outline here, it says he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And there are some scripture references there for you if, you, if you're interested in checking those out. Right, in the interest of time, we're going to kind of breeze over those. Uh, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, right? So not only did he suffer, but he suffered at the hands of a regular man, right? And the naming of the man gives us a time in history. So this is something that actually, it's an account of a thing that happened. It's not a myth or a legend. Um, was crucified, died, and buried, right? Uh, he descended into hell. He rose again from the dead. Let's get, get on the next page. Ascends into heaven. And then we, oh, we did forget the last two pieces here, right? So he's seated at the right hand of God. So who gets to sit at the right hand? What does that signify? Well, so there's there is a he's not referred to as sitting at the right hand of God prior to his incarnation, death, and resurrection. So uh, one of the things he tells his disciples before he leaves is that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, right? Yeah. And so the person who sits at the right hand of God is the person who's been given God's authority to carry out his will. Right? And now that person is no longer just the son of God divine, but true God and true man, Jesus, has been given all authority in heaven. And, uh, and that's when he gives his great commission to the church. Uh, why, so Why the three days? Oh, why, is there any, uh, is that just uh, just uh, um, so the three days, there's all kinds of things you can read into it. The number three related to the Trinity. Um, you could also say that that was God's way. He does this sometimes in scriptures. Uh, well, actually quite a bit. He tries to set things up in such a way that the only explanation could be God's di divine intervention. Right. And so here it wasn't like he was only dead for a couple hours and then yeah. you could have claimed he was resuscitated or something like that. Um, and they even go as far to, from the human side, which of course is part of God's plan, they rule an impossibly huge stone in front of it so nobody can move it and, and get him out and pretend and all of this stuff, right? So we usually understand that as more of like making it clear Jesus is dead, dead, right? Not only to those who are following him, but also to his enemies. Um, because that's a part of the power of the witness of the resurrection, is you can't sort of explain it away. Um, that's a good question. Okay. Um, and then the last, and this is the crucial piece, because he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and he sits at the right hand of God, he is now the judge of the living and the dead. So when the, the day of the Lord comes, it will be Jesus returning and judging the living and the dead. Right? Because he's been given that. Um, and so he carries that. Any questions about that stuff? I kind of have a question yeah, yeah. on that. Uh, forgive me if this is off topic. No. I've read that, you know, when we die, our soul immediately goes to heaven. If, or not, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. But then on, on the last day, he comes and judges us. Haven't we already been judged if we are, if our soul is in heaven with him? Sure. So that's a great question. So uh, for those who didn't hear, the question is that, that well, pe people will often say, oh, um, so it is often said when people pass um, and die in this life, they'll, they'll say that, uh, that they're with God in heaven, right? And there's no like sense of waiting. Um, hello. Oh, there you are. Hi, Sandy. Are you intend? Did you intend to join this class, or are you trying to get into the other one? Hey, Pastor. No, I was going to come into this class. Is that okay? Oh, that's totally fine. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. yeah well, thanks. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that we talk about is that um, 
the reference, the biblical reference for that is when Jesus is talking to the people on the cross, and he says, surely today you will be with me in paradise. Um, but then there are also scriptures that refer to the last day, and then that the dead will be raised, and it will all be judged, right? Um, so it's a both and. Um, when scripture does that, it's always, it's pretty much always a both and. Um, so we understand it as it is the now and not yet. So you're with God, but not in the fullness of his kingdom. It has yet, not yet been fully established. So we understand it as like your spirit. So only a part of you is with him in, in the time that you're waiting for the, the full redemption of, of the, the creation of heaven and the new heavens and the new earth. And so, uh, so the other aspect of that that is sort of difficult is, um, have you ever been on like a really long car ride? And have you fallen asleep the whole time? And when you wake up, did you have any sense of the past 16, 17 hours you were sleeping? No, right? And so we're also, it gets difficult because we're moving from a temporal thing to an eternal thing. And so time gets very bizarre because I think a lot of what stimulates those sort of questions is people are like, so am I just like, just like sleeping, hanging around for like a million years <laughs> and then waiting for Jesus to come back. Um, and there's really the, the scriptures don't really give us a sense of, of whether or not like essentially at that point you're an eternal being and the sense of time is totally different. I don't know how it works. I've been there yet, um, but uh, that's that's usually the way that I explain it, um, and that I think the scriptures teaches that. So we can offer the immediate comfort, right? Because, like, in in terms of sin, right, we've been saved, fully justified, right? Um, so we are with we are with Christ, but His full plan is not yet completely fulfilled until the day of the Lord, right? Because that day is just for humanity, but it's for all of creation, right? So. Uh, another another sort of common conception that confuses this topic a bit, I think, is this image. Of, well, what do you think of when you think of heaven? What are, what are the images that we usually put out there? I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's a good place, and there's a lot of people who know this. Okay. What is it going to look like? I don't know. Well, what are, how do we usually portray it? We think of it as, like, and yeah, being, seeing Jesus and, and streets of gold. Yeah, streets of gold. Do yeah. you? How do you usually envision yourself? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what I would be like if I ever. Did. Well, my point is that we don't often think of it really as a truly physical place. Like when you're thinking about yourself in heaven, you're not thinking about are my knees going to hurt? Are my feet going to get tired? Right? You're usually yeah. envisioning yourself as some floating wispy thing. That's just flitting around and enjoying this, itself. Right? You know, my fog was so Catholic, of course. And you don't know what heaven is. I mean, if there's so many relatives right beside you, you, don't, you can't even see them. So well, we do, we do get, actually get more information than we think. We just ignore the information in Scripture and come up with our own images, which is why it's confusing. So Scripture actually describes heaven as a very physical place. Um, it is a new heavens and a new earth. And it's not a place that we're going to like go off to, but a place that God is going to bring here, right? So uh, the image in Revelation is that Christ is, and the new Jerusalem is coming down, right? And and of course you have this grand description of this amazing, more, the more amazing city than anything that's ever been made or conceived of in our like world. In the Wizard of Oz. Even better than that. <laughs> Even better than. That. And I, I just have a quick question as a follow up to Jackie. Yeah. I always thought there was sort of small waiting in heaven as a word. All right, so that in the Catholic Church, that's called purgatory. Yes. And we do not, we we don't believe that Scripture talks about purgatory. Oh, thank you. So there's nice no idea. there's no waiting period in that sense. Um, there is a waiting period in the sense of the full realization of the the new creation. Um, but you're not like just like hovering your spirit's not just hovering above your body as it decomposes over time on the ground and you're just like waiting right um so and and so i try to encourage people 
to just read the aspects of scripture and take them as for what they are without getting too much into like how the timing of everything after death is going to work because that's we just have no real experience or conception of that kind of life yeah and there's also right. something else sorry to interrupt but there's also something else in chapter one that the baby has died before the death like it goes I can't see it. Mm -hmm. limbo yes thank you Jeff. oh yeah so we actually teach that uh, uh based on the example of john the baptist that children in the womb can actually receive the holy spirit because John does. So when whenever Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, or not Elizabeth, Elizabeth? I'm totally wrong. Okay. I was like, in my head, I was like, that is that it? Was, but that's Sarah. Uh, so that she comes to visit her, and as soon as she greets Elizabeth, John the Baptist leaps in her womb, right? Because he heard the voice of the mother of the Lord, right? And so uh, what we teach is that, like what I encourage parents who are worried about things like that is, and I actually got my sister-in-law a pair of little headphones that you can actually like stick onto your stomach and you can play music or have scripture passages and things like that but you can also just read them out loud and we we believe that children can receive the spirit the same way we do right uh, and part of that is linked to this is a great question part of that is linked to the idea of faith as a gift right so that means that you receive it the same way as if you're nine minutes old and if you're 99 years old it's not an act of your own will that you're consciously like creating faith. It's a gift given through the word of God. Because I, I didn't think it was right to be poor children who died before they were baptized into the window. Now, but it is a difficult question. You can't totally dodge the difficult nature of it in that, um, you know, and you can create these really particular hypothetical situations, which I've yet to run into any of these, but, um, and I hope I never do, is that the person says like, well, we didn't go to church during my pregnancy. We never read the Bible during my pregnancy and all of that. And so how are they going to know? And what happens to that? What, what happens to the baby? And in those instances, I'd have to say, I, I don't know. We trust in what we do know. And so I would preach the gospel and I would, and I, you know, I'd speak the gospel to them. But I wouldn't have the authority then to say I know exactly what happened because that's not not been revealed. Right? So, um, <clears throat> and thank you for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. And in most cases, in my experience, not just with situations like that, but really high intensity emotional situations, those sorts of questions are not usually asked with wanting an answer returned. They're usually asked in the sense that, like the Psalms of Lamentation, are asking God. <laughs> Why are you so far from me? Right? There isn't. A, they don't want somebody to be like, "Well, actually, so he's on vacation <laughs> this week, and, and so pay attention to this part of the world and not the other." You know, they they're expressing grief, they're expressing frustration, and God wants you to express those things to Him, um, and then place your trust in Him. So the general bent of Scripture is there are elements about God and our relationship with God that He doesn't explain and we don't know about, and in all of those instances. We get the same answer that Job gets, and Job's an, the, the answer Job gets is, "I'm God." So he starts out by saying, "Where were you when I laid the foundations of the universe?" In other words, he's saying, "I'm in control. Trust me." And so, for us as Lutherans, what we typically do—not just with questions like that, but any question where we kind of cross into the territory of the hidden aspect of God—is we trust and put our hope in the things He has revealed to us. Right. And so it is, uh, you can say, like, God is love and his desire is for all people to be saved. So it's hard to conceive of a situation beyond the, the control of an individual that they will then be held responsible for. Now, I think we, at times as humans, like, make the number of things that fall in that category far larger than they actually are. Um, but that's kind of how we interpret those issues. Did I make you more confused no, by the not. answer? No, um, you didn't. Well, good. Good. All right. So, any questions on first and second articles? We're going to move on to the third article, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, that's the sheet that I just handed out today. Okay. So, third article. So, we talked about that, that each one of these has a person and a main point. 
and just as a review for us in the third article who's the main person and what's the main main act god there's a particular part of god you holy missed this spirit. part last week huh holy spirit. holy spirit right and what's the big act what's the action the holy spirit is doing that we're celebrating and confessing uh no that was jesus establishing our faith uh, no, that was Jesus. Sanctification. Sanctification, right? You too, Dick. No, I had it written down from last week. <laughs> Sanctification. Do you guys remember from last week what that word means? Made holy. To be made holy, right? Also written on my piece of paper. There you go. Hey, there's nothing wrong with, with taking notes. <laughs> to be made holy, right? So this is the fancy uh, theological word we use for the life of a Christian, a Christian life, is a life of sanctification. And how are we made holy? We're made holy by going and building houses in other countries and giving lots of money to people in need? No. No? Okay, then how are we made holy? Hmm? Yeah, right? So Jesus makes us holy. So then what does the Holy Spirit do? Huh? Keeps us holy. So, Holy Spirit, can, you can say, keeps us holy. By what means? It isn't by works. By belief. Okay, how does the Holy Spirit keep you believing? We don't know. Where does he bring you? Word we do in, know. Word and sacrament. Hey. Hey. Word and sacrament. Word. The word and sacrament, if you're if you're newer to Lutheranism, this may be an unfamiliar phrase too. If you if you're transferring from another Lutheran church, you've probably heard it about. Word and sacrament are the main mission of the church. Right? So um, sort of a crass way of putting it is if we do a bunch of amazing mission trips where we serve people and we love them and we build houses for them, but we don't bring these things. Those were in eternal, in, in, in the eternal realm of things, those were all sort of worthless. Right. Um, now, I'm not saying that what we do is a bait and switch, but we are what we're about, right? So, in order to honestly serve one another, you're also expressing the thing in you that prompts you to do that. Bait and switch to God. Huh? <laughs> well, it's interpreted as one. In this case, it wouldn't be, but a bait and switch in the, in the context of mission is like, Hey, we're doing this fun event. Come on in. And then when they get there, you do the fun event, but then you also make them stay for a Bible study. Oh. Right? That's a bait and switch. So you offered one thing, and then when they got there, it was a different thing. Right? And um, can the Holy Spirit work through your baiting and switching of God's word? Yeah. The Holy Spirit works through all manner of our mess ups when it comes to our, our poor endeavors to carry out God's will. Right? But normally, uh, our focus is on word and sacrament. Right? Now, that can be used to, to not go on mission trips or to say, oh, we don't really need to, which is also not correct, right? Because what is the outpouring of these things supposed to be? Love. Yeah. Right? What we talked about in the sermon is like living out the love, because this that's where this is coming from, right? The love from Jesus is coming from word and sacrament, not so that you can be like, oh, gosh, I'm loved, and I just, I'm just so grateful for being loved, and I'm going to go home, and I'm just going to be so grateful for being loved and eat at my table and go to work and be grateful. No, it's so that you can share that, what you receive, to those that God has called you to do so, right? So, um, and, and this is why... Do that is. Do what? We just find out randomly who that is. Well, we do know some. And this is why I love the doctrine of vocation. Yeah, I talked a little bit about it in the sermon today. We know who God has called us to based on the fact that you already have many relationships. And you are in those relationships for the purpose of serving God, glorifying him, and reflecting his love to those people. So maybe it's your family that God is calling you to love as Christ loved you. It's your co-workers. It's your church family, this group here that you're becoming a part of. It can be, and then there are also the ones you don't know, as Denise pointed out, right? You could go to Giant Eagle today and do your grocery shopping, and somebody next to you could have just gotten a horrible phone call. And they start there, you know, you can tell that they've either just been crying or crying. You might say, are you okay? And then you never know where that goes. There you go, right? And so the Lord has uniquely equipped you to deal with those situations you're placing, some of which 
we know, right? And that's what we say is, uh, in the Lutheran church, we say we have a God of means. And the main means, the word and sacrament, we call the means of grace. Now, I think that that dynamic is super important, okay? And here's why. We have a God of means. One is to uh, sort of combat the Platonism, which is that, that matter and spirit are separate things. Spirit is better than matter. And therefore, the ritual, the physical rituals of the life of faith are really not as important as the inner spiritual self. And the Bible says, uh-uh, that's not the way it works, right? What did God say at the end of every day of creation? He saw that it was good. He likes it. He made it, right? So we believe that he still uses it, even in its fallen state. So when I get a, when I got the call to serve here as pastor, I didn't just like look into my own heart to find the answer. Right? Um, when we talk, sometimes when people talk about the, the moving of the Holy Spirit, they're just referring to the sort of vague, wispy thing that you can never really be sure of. Well, were you thinking about that because you had a bad burrito this morning? Or were you thinking about it because of the Holy Spirit, That's a right? Description yeah, right. What and, most people think. Yeah. And there, and there is an, don't get me wrong, there is an element to the nature of the Holy Spirit that is like that, right? It's described as, in the Hebrew, actually, the same word you use for spirit is the same word for wind and breath, right? So there is an element to the Holy Spirit that he's not going to listen to you. He's going to do what he does, right? And you can't control that. You can't grasp onto it. So an, an example of that is maybe you have somebody in your life, in your family, friends, that you've been praying will come to faith, and you've been praying for decades. That is an example where the Holy Spirit is going to do what he's going to do in his own time. And you have no control over that. And he doesn't even sometimes tell you just when it's going to be, right? <laughs> so what do we do in response to that? Do we say, well, he's got it taken care of? No, we then go to the means, which we've been given, to be a part of that situation, right? So what's one way that I can bring the Holy Spirit to bear in someone's life, even if I have no idea when it's going to bear its fruit? By who? God. Yeah, right? And that would be an example of speaking the word, right? Now, that doesn't mean you're like, oh, I hear what you're saying. Hold on. Let me go get my Bible and open up to this chapter and verse and read it to you. But it's the outpouring of those realities in your own words, right? Like somebody is feeling horrible about themselves and they feel unloved. Then you have an opportunity to tell them about somebody who does love and loves them, not because of their, their self-worth or anything that they value because just because he loves you uh, you, know, love you, know, you don't say that in uh, super high food language um you just use regular language like you'd be talking to right? um so the other reason that i love means of grace is you can grasp god through the means of grace not because you've gotten a special ability now that you're a lutheran that you can latch on to god but because he has put himself in those places for your benefit. So most people are familiar with the phrase, don't put God in a box. And so for my sort of mind associated with that, with the having a God of means is, but if God puts himself in a box, you should open the box. So one of the great things about having a God of means, as we say in the word in the sacrament, God has distilled himself down into a particular place for a particular purpose so that we can grasp onto it it's for our benefit, right? So baptism, how, is, how can baptism do such great things? Well, surely not just water, but water in, with, and under the word of God does these things, right? And then when God says in his word that you are mine, it's a visible, tangible promise that you can feel. It's an historical event that you can refer to so that you can grasp and hold on to that promise, even when the world or your own simple flesh is trying to rip it from you. So that is, that's, that's a big teaching in the Lutheran church is this means of grace. And it helps us understand these dynamics. And it doesn't mean that we're going to understand everything about God or how the Holy Spirit works. There's still that hidden aspect. But one of the reasons that we're so big about church is we believe that God instituted the church for the purpose of bringing word and sacrament to bear in the lives of redeemed sinners. I love what you said, that God said that you are mine. Yes. That, that's. That makes a big difference. 
Yeah, and I love drawing that connection to the same, the same word that said, let there be light, and there was, is the same word that declares you forgiven, and you are, and declares you a child of God, and thus now you are, not by anything you've done, but by something acting on you and recreating you. Right? We say the word of God is um, an autogenetic word. It creates what it speaks. And in that proclamation of the gospel, that's what is going on. So in baptism, when that happens, whether it's a 35-year-old who can say the words themselves, or it's a 30-month-old who can't, and the parents are speaking on the half, or even if they've been out of the womb for 10 minutes and it's out of a plastic bowl, right? We believe in the promise, not because of the mental state of the person receiving it, but because of the person who's getting it. That's how promises work. Um, and so this is a, this is sort of the big thing for us. And so that's why we operate through Sunday morning in the church, right? And so um, I, I have a friend who kind of expressed it in a way I really liked, because typically he said, we think of evangelism beginning at the edge of the church property out into the world. And he said, I think it begins at the altar and flows out from there, right? because this is the source of our ability to do any of these loving things vocational thing and if you become disconnected from that over time what happens you become starved for these gifts which are needed to sustain your faith because the world is not a neutral place the world is actively seeking the devil is actively seeking to undermine this message not only so that you can't tell other people but also in your own heart so that you'll start to not believe They'll say, well, those are nice promises, but you, I mean, you know what you did. They aren't really for you. I mean, like they say that, but you're extra horrible, so it's really not for you. Right? And we kind of chuckle, but people really feel that way. I've met them. They think they, they're not good enough to be a Christian, which is extra sad for them. Because it's like they believe it, but they just don't believe that it's for them. Yeah. And so it's our job to say, let me tell you about me. And we can join on the, the chorus of Paul and Luther. If I'm in, that means literally everyone, because I'm horrible. Right. Um, and, and Paul is even, I think, now a good reminder. I think that's one of the reasons God chose Paul to minister to the Gentiles, right? Is Paul literally is responsible for the murder of early Christians. So when he says, like, chief of sinners, he really means it. Right? And so, like, any time that you're feeling really down or horrible and, and thinking because of that, there's no way that God can love me, remember Saul becoming Paul. Right? That, uh, and another way that somebody that I, I like to read has expressed this is that we're beggars telling other beggars where to find the bread. Right? So we're both in need of the same thing all the time. Right. So we're not now this new enlightened person who's like by our own grace coming out to help this person who doesn't know stuff. Right. Um, it's like I'm somebody who is in desperate need of Jesus, who is now thankfully receiving him because he's found me and he's asked me to help bring others to him. Because they need the same thing that I'm getting. Right? So we're never like I think it really hampers our ability to witness about Christ because we're never getting beyond the beggar stage until. Christ returns again. And we're still in, we're always in need of what Christ has to offer. So that is kind of the, the, the engine of sanctification, right? You've been justified by the works of Jesus. Now the works of Jesus are brought to you in word and sacrament. God's given us some specific places where he's promised to be in order to sustain, create faith, and nurture it so that through that we can then love as he's loved us and reflect his light and his love into our own lives and the people that we come across. Right? Now, if you think about that, it makes a lot more sense than knocking on a random stranger's door and saying, if you die tonight, where do you think you're going to go? You go to a church. Why don't you come to my church, right? Because relationally speaking, you're skipping about 50 steps. Right? So imagine any other situation and it also becomes just sort of hilariously ludicrous, right? You're 
let's say you're going to have a, a Super Bowl party at your house. And there's a person who lives six houses down from you. You've never spoken to them in your life. They don't know who you are. Neither of you know each other's names. And you walk over and say, hey, why don't you come on over and bring a side dish and watch the Super Bowl with us? That's a weird thing to do. Yeah. Because they don't know you and you don't know them. And so, strange too. yeah, right. They're going to be like, uh, who are you? Like, nice to meet you. I'm Gary. Let's take things a little slower. <laughs> right. Uh, and so. Like, I'm not discouraging you from inviting people to church, but our job is to try and, like, do that in the ways God's naturally developed human relationships to function. So, like, we try to do events at church that are non-threatening so that it's more in line with those natural relationships. So, if you have been trying to witness to a coworker for the many years you've been at your job and you've invited them to church and they've never come, maybe they'll come to a barbecue out at one of the the men that we do have a men's Bible study, and we meet at somebody's house, we have a barbecue, or it's just a get together and say, Hey, it's just going to be a couple guys. We're going to grill some food, and drink some beer, and just chat. Because a lot of people, especially in the West, think they know who Christians are and what they're about. And most of the time, they're way off base because somebody who has a bad experience with the church or has no experience with the church at all has told them all about them or us, right? Or they were a Christian and they had a particularly bad experience and they think that all Christians are like. So one of the biggest icebreakers I think is like, oh, this person's I think, a normal person. They talk about and worry about the same things I do. He's even drinking a beer. What's going on? I thought these were like raving, judgmental lunatics. Right? Um, so that is sort of how vocation works. Right? Um, any questions about that? Okay, so that is kind of an, as a whole, our process of sanctification. It's fueled by the Holy Spirit. And I think I gave you this last time but I can't remember because I'm also teaching confirmation, so I could give it to them. Uh, and I, my sort of cutesy, memorable answer to what does the Holy Spirit do is he brings us the Jesus stuff. So we are able to do sanctification because the Holy Spirit brings us the Jesus stuff, which is just an easy way of remembering the word that has happened. And Paul talks about that. He says, he says, how are people going to come to faith unless they hear the word of God? How are they going to hear unless someone is sent? So that's us. We've been sent. Um, one uh, way that this is uh, kind of cleared up, too, because I think there's some denominational disagreements about this, is uh, whose primary responsibility is evangelism? in the church. So here at Ascension, whose primary responsibility is evangelism? That was mine. Okay. Sorry. Huh? Okay, so we have all of us or mine. Pastor. Well, the primary. Okay, primary. Pastor as primary. Okay. Any other options? The whole, okay, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> He's okay. on our side. Yeah, he is on our side. Very good. I guess that is the like meta right answer, um, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but practically through the means, right? Um, I actually, those are the two basic answers. Either it's everyone's responsibility or it's the professionals, right? Uh, in this case, the, the guy who went to school and wears the fancy outfit, the uniform or whatever, and talks about God all the time, blah, 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 right? Um, well, it is actually, what really helps is in ministry, so you have ministry, of the church, and there's private ministry obligations <coughs> and public ministry obligations. So as a pastor, we'll just use my vocation as an example. As a pastor, I have unique public ministry obligations that you don't have. For example, I'm not going to ask Melissa or Gerald or Denise, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be out of town in a couple of weeks. Could you do the sermon on Sunday? Right? That's not your ministry obligation, right? It's not part of your vocation. Right? It is a part of mine or teaching a Bible class, so that that can be either or. Um, so as a as a pastor, I have certain public ministry obligations that are unique to my calling and my office. So the question is: Is evangelism one of those, or is it a private ministry obligation shared by the priesthood of all believers? And so our answer is exhibited those two dynamics, right? One could be 
the pastor, right? He's he's the guy who knows the stuff or whatever, right? Yeah. And then there's all of us, right? Now we would say that it's all of us, right? Because how well do you know your children or your neighbor versus how well do I know them? And how well do you know my family and my neighbor? Good point. Right? And so, and a lot of this, sometimes people are like, but that's going to take forever. Not really, actually. It's much, it's a much, it makes more sense um, and it's much more effective. So one example I give people sometimes when they're um, kind of pushing back against that idea is, well, imagine Ascension has, let's say we're worshiping like, we're worshiping like 85 people, including online. If pastor, I just have a, I just have an awesome week. I'm on fire for the Lord and I go out and I'm talking to everybody about him and 10 new people show up the next week. Good job me, right? Yeah. But if you guys are just having a normal week, but God presents you all with an opportunity to share his word, out of that comes one person coming to church. So in the example of the pastor, there were 10 people here. In the other example, there were actually 85. Each person got one. Right? So which one had more people? The one, one for each person. And which one's likely to work and be consistent? And dependable as far as the process. The people that did it before. Yeah, right. Because like I may have a week like that at some point, but maybe like one in my whole ministry, where I just presented with a lot of opportunities, or I meet a group of people through some event that that my my vocation puts me in, and that's the result, right? But really, it's meant to go out through these relationships, right? Just in the same way that it's a bad idea to have like public officials responsible for the value teaching and well-being of your own children one of sort of the snap responses okay of the government you care about my children just as much as i do okay what are their names right and the point being that god has intentionally set up human structures and and, and relationships to function in these ways and so it would make sense that the method that he wants to bring their salvation would work through those things that he has set up so that's kind of the doctrine I can't witness the people at the places you work at. They don't know me. It would be weird. Right? Like, and you would not like it if I showed up to visit you at your work and then I started trying to proselytize all your coworkers. Because you're, <laughs> you're going to think I'm some weirdo because my pastor showed up and started being weird, right? Um, and so that's why we really like the idea and we believe it's the scriptural teaching or the way that we share the gospel. You know, right? just say something. Yeah. Briefly. When I first started coming here, I started telling people that I work with and people that are my family. I have to go to church and because I want to. Yeah. You know, a lot of my family members do not go to church in my life. I'm going. And I love it. Yeah. It makes me feel good. And our understanding of that is that that is a way that you're reflecting the love of Christ in your vocational calling as sister daughter, co-worker, co -worker, friend, etc. right? And the unknown part is you never know what you say or when you say it. It's the Holy Spirit's going to take that and prompt faith. And it, it may not send them here. It may send them to a church they haven't been going to or whatever. You really shouldn't worry about that. Exactly. Because it's not, that's that aspect of it isn't your job. So if we're talking, yeah. Plant the seed yes. And Very good. Yeah. Good. That we're, we're planting the seed. What is the seed? Just on where at. Sure. So the what it, so I should say what in the scriptures is usually the seed when they use the seed in the parable. Like there's a couple of parables. There's a lot of agricultural imagery in the Bible. And there's a couple of parables that do talk about the planting of seeds when, in reference to what we're talking about. And do you know what usually is the seed in those teachings? Faith. Hmm. Yeah. Faith is what grows out of that seed. The thought. Yeah. Work. Word. The work is the seed. Right. And so in the parable of the sower, the sower scattering seed all over the place is him sharing God's word indiscriminately. Right. 
And it's so he's not, I mean, if you were thinking he's this planned farmer that has lots of years of experience, he's a horrible sower. He's just throwing it everywhere. <laughs> he's like, well, there's rocky ground and here's the path and here's good soil and here's thorny. And he's just throwing it everywhere, right? Um, and that's what we're called to do, to share God's word, right? And we don't worry about the back end of things because that's, that's God's thing. I can't change the hearts of anyone. I can't even change my own heart. Right? I need Jesus for that. So they so do they. Good, good thought. Uh, okay. Now that we've only got 10 minutes left, let's start. <laughs> um, so most of this, again, is, is scriptural references for your own benefit. We're not going to have time to go through a lot of them. So if you're curious about any of the things we talk about, where they're found in the scriptures, that's what those references there are for. Um, what does the Holy Scriptures teach us about the person and work of the Holy Spirit? Um, we kind of covered that already. It is to give us the Jesus stuff to bring um, the gifts of God to us. And to whom does the Holy Spirit direct us? God. More specific than that. Jesus. 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 Very good. <laughs> Very good, Jesus, right? Um, and so the uh, uh, and he does that because Jesus is the the object of faith that leads to salvation, right? So uh, there's, I think it's in John when Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit to his disciples. He actually, I love the way he expresses. It. He says that what the Holy Spirit is going to do is he's going to give you remembrance of everything that I have spoken to you. So he, through the Holy Spirit, is how you remember the things that I have given to you. And you know, um, Jesus wasn't human. And we don't know what God is, but he's the father of Jesus. But Jesus was a man. Well, Jesus was true God and true man. I know. So he was 100% both. But he was on this earth, mm -hmm. this planet with us. We don't know where God is exactly, but we believe him. Well, God is everywhere. I know. He's omnipresent. But yeah, so Jesus is, so Jesus is like the epitome of this word and sacrament dynamic, right? If God is a being beyond our understanding that we cannot grasp, then he put himself in a man-shaped box named Jesus so that we could see, hear, and understand. I always thought that's why he did that. Yeah, it is why he did that, right? Well, I mean, he did it to save us, but that was the, the means by which he did that, Um but I do like the idea that the Holy Spirit gives remembrance of all the things that Jesus taught, because that's also kind of doubles into our belief about the scriptures being inspired, um, therefore, infallible and inerrant, right? Is how do the disciples, you know, maybe they forgot some key details when they were writing the stories of Jesus. Well, he sent the Holy Spirit so that they would be given remembrance of all the things. Okay, saving faith is a gift of God, top of the next page. The Holy Spirit creates and establishes faith in the hearts of sinners. He works this in and through the gospel. Therefore, we do not bring ourselves to saving faith in Christ. Rather, we are brought to faith by God and the Spirit. And here's what Luther has to say in large head. That you and I could never know anything about Christ, believe in him, or have him as our Lord if the Holy Spirit did not offer it all to us and plant it in our hearts with a good, when the good news is preached. The work has been done. Christ has won the treasure for us by his suffering, dying, and rising again, and so on. But if his work stayed hidden and no one knew about it, it would all be for nothing and no good to anyone. God and his word publicized and proclaimed and has given us his Holy Spirit to bring this treasure, this rescue, near to us and make it ours. So to make us holy means the same as to bring us to the Lord Christ to receive the good which he, we could not get on our own. So, and back to the, the word and the sacrament, right? the good that we would not be able to get on our own. How do these passages make clear that salvation is God's work and not our own? So let's look up John 15, verse 16. So this was actually in our gospel, our gospel reading today. And this, I love this one because anytime I'm tempted to think that my, my, I'm like the one that's, that's initiating the relationship with God doesn't get any clearer than this verse. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that that fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give to you. 
you did not choose me. I chose you. Which at first is disconcerting because we have no control. We, we like control. And so recognizing that we don't have any control over that is a little scary at first. But when you have come to faith in the gospel, it's actually of extreme comfort because that means that you're not responsible for that, re that relationship. Like Christ is, and he has chosen you and appointed you. Uh, in what places does the Holy Spirit operate to create and sustain faith in Christ? Um, this will be the last one we look at today. So we'll divide these up. Kurt, can you look up the John 3, 5 to 6? Um, let's see. Jackie, can you look up John 6, verse 63? Um, who else has got a Bible that can look up? Melissa, can you look up the Matthew 26, 27, and 28? Anyone else? I'll look up the last one. Ephesians 5. John 3, 5, and 6. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit so in what place does the holy spirit operate to create and sustain faith in christ baptism, baptism. very good so he's referring to baptism there and those born of water and the spirit mm -hmm. and water and the word okay uh, john 6 verse 63 the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. All right. So in what place there? The words. The words. The words of Jesus, right? The words of the word of God. Uh, Matthew 26. Okay, I have the same chapter. That's okay. Okay. Um, it's a beautiful translation. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new testament. Shed for many for the remission. Right? Lord's table. Right? So these we're identifying the places where the Holy Spirit has promised to be present and work. Right? So we have baptism, we have the word, and we have uh, Lord's table communion. Right? I got the Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what other place? Yeah, worship, right? Worship. Right? So singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, right? <laughs> So the two dynamics in our worship services are the sacramental gifts of the body and blood of Jesus. And then the first part of our service is centered around the word of God, right? So historically in the Christian church, those services are divided into the service of the word, the service of the sacrament, because those are the two big things that God is doing. He's, the divine is serving you in the divine service. And then what, what is our task <coughs> is to return worship and praise, singing the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs. Um, very good all right we will continue with this and finish this up next week um so if you want to look ahead a little bit because we're going to be looking we'll finish up the third article of the creed and then we're going to start into the first part on baptism uh, next week okay. all right let us close with a word of prayer dear heavenly father we give you thanks and praise that you have chosen us and appointed us to go out and share your love with those that you have placed in our lives, our family members, our coworkers, our friends, and our church family. Help us continually point, be pointed to Christ by the grace of your Holy Spirit and help us by your Holy Spirit's grace to be the ones that assist in pointing others to you. We thank you that through the Holy Spirit, you have given us your word and your sacraments so that we are sustained in the midst of the conflict with the powers of darkness in this world, and know that we are not alone in that struggle, that you are right there with us, giving us everything we need in order to remain strong in our faith in Jesus. I ask your blessing upon each 
the members of this class as they go out to do the work in their vocations that you have placed them in this week. Bless their efforts to reflect the light of Christ and the love of Christ that you have given them into those that they meet. And bring us safely back here next week as we continue to worship and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, I'm glad you could join us. <laughs> yeah.